Hello. Thank you, Kamiko. Um, we are so excited to be here and um, and share some of the resources that we have through Texas History Day and National, which is an affiliate of the National History Day program. Pretty much every state has a program, including U.S. territories and international schools. So um, it's a pretty extensive program. So um, so we're going to that's kind of what we're going to talk about. We're going to give you um, a few little tips on um, on research. And um, you can use what we're giving you today, the resource we're giving to you, giving you and the information we're giving you today. Um, you can use it in your classroom. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have your students compete in the program if you don't want to. If you feel like it's too much the first year or something like that, you can still use the resources in your classroom and um, it's still very beneficial to you in that way. So we'll go ahead and get started. So well, let me make sure that I'm, yeah, we got, we're going to start off with a poll. So um, Kamiko is our, our Vanna White of Poles. And uh, so um, the first poll question, uh, what types of research projects have you assigned in your in the past in your classroom? So just go ahead um, and, and we'll give you just a, a few seconds since it's a pretty quick poll. Okay. It looks like really that um, it's kind of a mix of all of the above. Um, and then with the historical paper, oral presentations, you know, a model exhibit. So, um, OK, that sounds um, that sounds kind of like what we were expecting. We expected um, some of the teachers to kind of um, to have a mix of that, if not kind of spread it all around a little bit, do share different things. So. Um, I am going to X out of that. There we go. Okay. Whoops, it came back on me. Okay, so um, National History Day, and these are pictures from our most recent national contest for Texas. Um, took a contingent of 73 students to national contest in um, at the University of Maryland in near Washington, DC. And so these are some of the, the photographs from our um, from our students there. But um, it is a really exciting um, program that really concentrates on analysis, um, historical research, and critical thinking. Um, and it allows students to be creative in their interpretation of of what they find, um, the information they find from their sources. Um, so, okay. Um, one of the things that um, National History Day or Texas History Day is it's project project based learning, and I know that that's um, kind of a buzzword or buzz term right now in education. And so, because the students are really, it's really. Um, it's really the students that are kind of in control of, of this, but then they're able to put everything, what they learn into a sort of project and they get their hands on um, on the history as well. So um, it's, and it's personalized to them so they can choose various categories, various ways of um, expressing themselves and sharing what they've learned. And it's authentic because it's the students. The students are the experts. Um, that's what we say whenever um, when we're talking to judges for the program, we were like, you don't need to know what the whenever you're judging, you just need you don't need to know the content because the students are the experts. And you can really see that when they start sharing their project and the extent of their research. So um, on the right, there is a um, exhibit that was uh, showcased in the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian from Texas. And um, so one student from Texas or one project from Texas was chosen to um, represent Texas at the Smithsonian. So one of the things that National History Day does and Texas History Day does is it provides um, kind of a framework for students and for teachers to help learn various skills. And um, it, they it takes the historical information, the sources, and it helps the students organize that. And then they're able to use different um, skills and techniques in order to present that information. So it definitely helps with their research and, and reading skills, of course. 
um, just by the nature of the research. Um, definitely with critical thinking because then they have to analyze. They need to analyze um, the sources they, between the, the primary and secondary sources and um, kind of use their their analysis side of their brain in order to um, to um, pull out what information will work for their project. Um, definitely uh, problem solving skills. And I think that comes in a couple of different ways because some, some of the students are in a group. So of course that means that they have to solve problems within the group sometimes because um, as you all know, not all students get along 100% of the time. So they definitely have to do, do problem solving within, but then they also have to problem solve if um, if they notice that there's a hole in their research, or if they know if they can't find a particular um, source, or if they're having trouble with something, they have to fit. Um, they have to figure out how to take care of that problem. And of course, the teacher is there to help guide them. And we're also here, so they can reach out to us. They can reach out to um, teachers. They can reach out to experts. So it definitely helps. And def and I would say the self-esteem and the confidence is one of the one of the major aspects we can see firsthand because the students, we can see their project at the beginning of the year. And then as it develops at each stage of the con of the contest or throughout the year, when they share that presentation or they share that the historical research they've done, it is, you can see that they've grown. Um, when they, at the beginning of the year, they're unsure and um, by the end of the year, they're speaking, speaking with such confidence. And we've had teachers say that after their um, student went through the program one year and then made it to state that um, this student decided that he wanted to go ahead and go on to college. And he, that wasn't, he wasn't thinking that beforehand. But I guess, um, you know, he realized what he could do and what he was capa capable of. So that's always um, a nice thing to see. Okay, so um, for this is the process for National History Day, and I'm going to turn it over to Danny because he's going to tell you about um, a topic, selecting a topic. Okay, so uh, the next group of slides are going to go through the process that a student would go through uh, to complete a National History Day project. And of course, the first step is to select a topic. Next slide. Okay, National History Day uses a theme approach. Each year there is a, na a national theme that all the students throughout the, the country use that same theme. The themes are always intended to be very broad and they can apply to uh, state history. So if you're a seventh grade teacher doing Texas history and you want your students to do only Texas history, uh, they can stick with their state history. Uh, it could be American history, world history, local history, you know, any type of history is going to fit that broad theme. So the theme helps them focus their research and helps them with their analysis and uh, the proper context and that sort of thing. Uh, so each year there's a theme narrative uh, that's contained in the theme booklet. Uh, and you'll have access to both of those uh, in the information that's in the Google Classroom. Okay, next slide. So this year's theme uh, is turning points in history. So you see automatically how broad that is. Uh, so you would want to help the students understand that theme, uh, looking at a turning point as, as being the point at which a significant change occurs, or, or in other words, a decisive moment. Uh, so then this is how you can help students select topics. So for example, if a student was interested in a particular war, they wouldn't want to try to cover the whole war in their project. They would want to find where the turning point was in the war. It might have been a particular battle, or it might be the impact of the war on a particular group of people, uh, something along those lines. Uh, another example, if students are interested in a civil rights topic, they would want to look for a key moment in uh, the struggle that a specific group had uh, in their 
uh, struggle for gaining the, the rights that they were entitled to. Uh, so there's you know lots of ways to look at this theme. Uh, another example is if there's an innovation or a scientific discovery, uh, you would want to look at how that influenced the course of events that followed. So uh, those are the kind of turning points you want students to look for. Uh, we always encourage students to find some unique or lesser known topics uh, that they can that they can research, you know, rather than doing the tried and true ones that automatically come to mind uh, when they hear the theme turning points in history. OK, next slide. Uh, also notice the words in history on the topics and uh, we recommend that their main topic be at least 20 years old. Uh, there needs to be enough time has passed to uh, have have some analysis and see the impact of that of that topic in history. Uh, if it's a more recent event, say for example the COVID crisis, the COVID pandemic, uh, there, there's not been enough time to see the impact of that in history. Uh, but if they were interested in that sort of topic, they could look back at the Spanish flu and uh, in the early 1900s and uh, possibly do a comparison to the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, but their main focus should be that that older uh, uh, pandemic, the, the Spanish flu that and, and the influence that it had uh, and the impact that it had uh, uh, over a number of years. So uh, we, we generally use at least 20 years old. Okay, next slide. Okay, students need to weave the theme throughout the project, not just mention it once, but you know, weave it uh, throughout. So we wanna look at uh, how things were before the turning point, uh, what happened during the turning point, and then how it changed. So we're looking at those short-term and long-term uh, impacts uh, in, in history going beyond their basic uh, topic. Okay, next slide. Uh, so here's some just some tips that you can use with the students. Uh, it's always best that the student picks a topic that they're interested in. Uh, if they find it boring from the very start and they have to work on it for several months, you know they're not going to do uh, the, their best quality work. So. Uh, First of all, finding something that they're interested in. Uh, secondly, find a topic that that the research materials are going to be available. Uh, they need to use both primary and secondary sources. So uh, picking a topic that where they can find those uh, those sources are available and and they may vary from place to place. And you know, so for example, if uh, someone picked a topic in early European history, for example, they may find that a lot of their materials are written in another language that, that they can't read, and and therefore those prime, especially those primary sources, might not be as readily available. Uh, so, uh, looking for topics where the research materials are going to be available um, uh, is is important. And then the third thing as a tip is looking for a topic that's the right size. It's not too narrow that they don't have that historical importance or it's not too broad that it's too complex to help uh, to handle in, in the project that they're doing. So uh, looking at that. And I think our next slide uh, has a, a little diagram to help students narrow their topic. So, you know, you start with a theme and then break it down to an area that they're interested in or what the teacher requirement is. So it might be a broad topic, might be something like civil rights or World War II or, you know, something very broad. And then they need to look for that narrow down topic uh, that gets them to a specific topic that is the right size for uh, the, their research project. Okay, next slide. All right, next poll. Poll question number two. 
On this poll, it asks, what challenges do your students face in researching historical topics? And that's going to be the next part of our presentation that Lisa is going to present. Okay, getting close. Need a few more responses, please. All right. Um, yeah, uh, I think that definitely, especially in a classroom, you would find that students would it would be a mix of these of all these problems, and and we definitely understand that. So. Um, I am going to talk to you all about some of these some of these issues and um, how we can how you, maybe some strategies or some resources to help you with that. Um, just to, um, on a side note, we will be having um, the next webinar will be on researching and um, that we'll be doing with Humanities Texas, and that's in October. So definitely, uh, I believe it's October sixteenth. Um, so if you want it to go more in depth on research uh, and, and help and guide your students in um, teaching with primary sources, that, that would be a great one for you to uh, sign up for. So um, whenever we're talking about um, primary sources and secondary sources, sometimes students get a little bit confused. Um, sometimes students think that a primary source is their most important source or the source they use the most. Um, of course, um, Logically, I mean, if you literally, that's that you would think that's what it means. So we can understand why students would think that. But a primary source, of course, is something that witness someone witnessed the event, or the author, the the maker of that source, um, witnessed the event, or it was done at the time of the event. Secondary sources are sources, of course, that um, have analyzed primary sources and um, come up with either. Uh, um, you know, a biography or um, there's, you know, newspaper articles that look back on an event, websites, that sort of thing. So those are the secondary sources, but you can definitely use secondary sources. Um, students can use those in order to look for primary sources. They just need to go, look, you know, look in the in the bibliography in the back and um, and see what primary sources were used by the person, um, the author or whoever developed that. Um, so whenever we, did I go too far? No. Okay. No. Um, <laughs> whenever we're talking about, um, historical argument, that's the new term that History Day has, um, for thesis, for writing a thesis. It seems to, the students tend to understand that a little bit more because, um, thesis is kind of this abstract word, but writing a historical argument, it, it seems to kind of click a little bit more. But um, basically, um, a, thesis, a thesis statement draws, really brings the whole project together, and it kind of gives gives you an idea of what is going on with their project, what their project is going to be about. Um, and it should be written after the preliminary re research. So, um, and then, of course, as they keep going, uh, revise. Um, some students will try to find sources um, that they've already come up to come to a conclusion. They want to find sources that that support that. Um, but students really need to be um, flexible and understand, let the research guide them. Um, and I am not a great thesis writer. I've had to work on it. It's something that that a lot of that people have to really work on sometimes because it has to be, um, you know, impactful. But it's only really a few sentences long. But it really has to it has to be impact, impactful, you know, and and draw the draw the attention. And so um, a, a well-written statement will address the topic um, it'll include the theme and it in, explains the impact. What? Why? What? So what? Like, why is it important? 
Um, it's the so what factor. Um, and so whenever um, we're talking about the historical argument, it is it's basically the topic plus the theme plus the impact. Um, primary sources that we were talking about earlier, those are things like um, interviews. Now interviews, um, really the transcript, they can, they can interview people that witnessed the event, but if they interview an expert, that is not a primary source because that, unless that expert witnessed the event, then they are not um, a primary source. Some students think that if they interview an expert because it is, they're interviewing a real person that is primary but it just really depends upon the context of that. Um, and then if they, if they, inter or if they um, find an interview, an oral interview in archives, they're more than welcome to, to use that. And that is considered a primary source, um, but they just need to make sure it's an unedited version that, or they have the transcript. Journals are another great one and letters. Sometimes if you can find letters or collections, um, in the archives from a certain, you know, from a certain uh, person or family, then those are treasure trove. Um, all sorts of documents, you know, census, a lot of the um, information on ancestry, that sort of thing. Those are primary source documents, magazine and newspaper articles written at the time of the event. If it's a, if it's something looking back on like the you know 20 year anniversary of an event that is not a primary source, and they really need to go back and um, check out the newspaper and magazine articles from that event. Um, one, I'm in a webinar. Yeah. What's up? One of the things that we um, that we see too is that students will find a picture that they really want to use, a historic photograph, and they really want to use it. Um, but they, they saw it on Wikipedia or um, the web, you know, a website. They really need to trace it back to the original source because um, photos can be edited and just like anything else, photos can be edited. So they really need to find where that picture came from. So on Wikipedia, they can go down to the, um, there's a bibliography portion in Wikipedia and they can go down and take a look at that or underneath the photo typically is where the, where the, authors or the creators of that article got that photo. So that's, um, they really need to trace it back basically. One other good um, place for primary sources are museums. They have artifacts and collections. And so artifacts are definitely a primary source as well. And um, they do ask for, um, in an annotated bibliography in National History Day, Texas History Day. And um, the entry um, basically needs to follow either the Chicago manual style or the MLA style. And um, the annotations can be no longer than three sentences. And it basically needs to say why this source was important. Um, so if it's a photo, we'd rather the students not say something like, um, this photo, this is a photo that helped me or showed me. and because of course we can see that from the sort, we know it's a photo, but why is it important? What, it, why, what did you gain from it? And it kind of makes students really think about their sources and why they were important to their project. And we ask that they separate the primary and the secondary sources into separate sections, just so it's clear that um, then they can take a look and see how many primary sources they have and, um, and secondary sources. And one of the ways that, that that will help in October is we'll kind of give you some tips, some tricks and tips on how to expand research and expand the sources. All right, so Danny's going to um, talk about um, creating the project. Okay, so once the students have selected a topic, narrowed it down, and completed their research, they uh, pull it all together by creating uh, their project. And so we're gonna look at the different kinds of projects that the students can do with the National History Day program. So here's a list and, and we'll talk a little bit about each one. So uh, they can, so you see the list of five different categories that students can uh, choose for their project. They can do a historical paper, so that's where your good writers want to write a paper. 
uh, an exhibit like the picture you see over on the right, uh, it's a three-dimensional, uh, like, like you would see in a museum. Uh, documentary, like you might see on the History Channel. Uh, a performance that's performed live. And then the fifth choice is a website. Uh, all of these can be completed by individual students working on their own. Uh, it, or, and for the four categories, except for papers, papers are individual only. The other four categories, exhibit, documentary, performance, and website, can also be done by small groups of students working collaboratively. So groups are considered to be two to five students working together. Okay, and we're going to talk just, a little bit about each of these categories here. Just really quick, one thing, if any elementary um, teachers are on here, we do have a new category for elementary students. It's a poster category for fourth and fifth grade. And um, there's some information on that specific, the requirements and stuff for that. But the general information that we're presenting now will cover that category, but it's in the Google um, Classroom um, for those resources are for you there. Okay, great addition there, Lisa. Lisa uh, keep in mind though, the uh, as far as the contest is concerned, which we'll talk about later, uh, the elementary division is a Texas only, so they can compete at the regional and state level, uh, but not advance to the national level. Okay, so each of the categories has specific rules, and uh, the rule book you can find in the in the Google Classroom there, uh, and the rules kind of level the playing field, so all of the students are kind of you know, working under the same parameters. So uh, the contest is not about rules, but but we have to have uh, rules, obviously, to uh, keep it under, keep it, keep the le level playing field and so forth. Uh, so the rules might relate to word count, so such in, in a historical paper, uh, the size of an exhibit, uh, the length of the documentary or performance, those kind of things. So we really encourage students, teachers, and parents to read the rules. So, because sometimes the parents might need to know so they can guide uh, their their students in, in creating their projects. So, um, the rule book is is very important there. Okay, next slide. Uh, so, obviously, I, I'm not going over all the rules, but I'll give you some of the basics so you know uh, what what you're looking at with each category. Uh, so historical papers ha have a word limit of 1,500 to 2,500 words. No, no more than 2,500. Uh, their, their paper includes footnotes and endnotes, but those aren't included in the word count. The word count is just for the paper itself, okay? Uh, the papers must have a process paper, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So that's kind of like a separate part of it that's, again, not in the 2,500 word count. Um, but if they put some explanations in their footnotes or their picture captions or any appendices, uh, that is part of the word count. So they have to kind of be careful of what they're uh, including in their, uh, in their footnotes and picture captions. Okay. Uh, the second category, exhibits. They have a size limit. Uh, the, and, and you'll see this in the rule book, the size limits no more than 40 inches wide, no more than 30 inches deep, and no more than six feet tall. Uh, so they, they have those size limits. So you think about it being on a tabletop, tables are typically about 30 inches wide. Uh, and so the exhibit needs to, to fit on a tabletop, although they can design it to, uh, to fit on, to stand on the floor, you know, either way as long as it fits within those size limits. The other thing that I'll mention is you, you typically see the, the trifold, the three section exhibit like you see in the picture there, but that doesn't mean that it has to be. You know, students can get creative and, and find different ways that, uh, that they can design their exhibit. Uh, exhibits do have a word count, no more than 500 student composed words. So if they put a document or a quote on their exhibit, that doesn't count in that word count. It's 
It's their analysis that they're putting in that 500 words. So students have to be pretty concise in getting down to the 500 words that are important uh, to present their analysis on their exhibit. Uh, any visuals that they have on their exhibit must be credited, but the words in the credit uh, do not count against them in their word count. Okay, next slide. Uh, documentaries where students use video editing uh, and which could be a combination of still pictures, video clips, and the narration that they've recorded. Uh, and it, it's limited to 10 minutes. So it's like what you would see on the History Channel, but much shorter, a, a 10 minute documentary. And then the next category is a performance. So in a performance, students have done their research, they write their own script, and their performance is performed live at the contest. And the time limit on that is 10 minutes. So they can design their own uh, set, uh, come up with costumes and so forth. Like you see in the pictures, students presenting the Wright brothers in their performance. And then the last category is websites. Uh, websites also have a word count limit of 1,200 words, and they also have a media uh, clip time limit of three minutes. Uh, back to the idea of a level playing field, there's all kinds of software out there for students to develop websites, and that would, and some of them are very expensive, so that uh, would cause give an unfair advantage to some schools over another. So what National History Day does is they provide a platform, NHD Web Central. It's provided by National History Day, and all students are required to use that platform to create their website. It also so it takes away the idea of of an expense. So any student that has internet access, either at school or at home can create a website. So it's not, not limited to those that have the, the fancy technology. As long as they have internet, they can create their website. Okay, so no matter what category the students might pick, they're gonna consider this so what factor. So uh, we want the students to get beyond just telling the story of what happened in a particular event whatever their turning point in history is. So we want them to look at things like cause and effect, change over time, uh, and really get into the impact of a topic in history and come up with their own analysis, draw their own conclusions uh, to look at both short range impact, what happened immediately after that event, and long range, what happened over the period of time. Um, so we call that the so what factor so uh, that students can kind of really consider that part of their analysis. Okay. And I mentioned earlier, I think the process paper, all entries have a process paper. And this is kind of one of the last things the students do is they're uh, put together the process paper because it basically tells what was the process of them doing their their project from the research part on to the creation of, of their entry. Uh, so you see the list of questions here that we want them to answer in the process paper. Now, we prefer that, that they write it as a uh, cohesive process paper, not a question and answer uh, type of thing. Uh, the process paper is limited to 500 words. Um, and so once they're, they're finished with with everything, their paperwork uh, consists of a title page, a process paper, and an annotated bibliography. And that's for all, all entries. Now, with some entries that won't be in paper form, for example, in a website, that's all put on their website. The title is on their title, uh, their homepage of their website, their process paper and bibliography are linked on on their website. But the other categories, typically it's a paper copy that's brought with them to contests 
although we are having them upload some of those things in the registration process. Okay. Poll question number three. The question is, what cross-curricular involvement could be incorporated into the National History Day process? So where do you see a connection with other teachers, other departments on your campus? All right, everybody's pretty quick now. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of what I expected that all of the above. So uh, those students that might be doing a scientific topic, you know, might have that science teacher involved uh, and um, helping mentor some of the History Day mm -hmm. projects. But um, the performances might be the drama teacher helping out, you know, so forth. Great. Okay, let me okay. get that out. Okay. All right. So the way that um, if you are interested in um, in going through the process of the of uh, the contest, the first um, step would be um, it could be your school. There may be a local um, contest first. So just check with your campus and see if the if there is a little if there is a school contest. But then it's the regional contest. And the regional contests, um, they're usually held in February or March, early March. And um, there's different regions across Texas. And so just go to texashistoryday.com and um, look for the regions and coordinator. And that will, you. the rule of thumb is that you go to the closest region to you. And so um, there's regions, um, there's, you know, South Plains, um, covers like Lubbock, the Lubbock area, and then we have the Panhandle Plains in the Amarillo area on down to, you know, and then there's Houston that has a, um, a few different regions just because of the size of the area. And so, and then Danny is the um, Syntex um, Regional Coordinator, which is the Austin area. So there's definitely, um, there's going to be a region that if it's not immediately next to you, it will be pretty close. That's what we try to do. So just check and see when those deadlines are there's a, a registration deadline typically, um, and sometimes that is also the project deadline. So you just wanna pay um, close attention to those. And so um, just go to texashistoryday.com, like I said, and go to the regions and, um, and coordinator section. You can see who, who to contact. If you contact them and they don't get um, back to you, go ahead and contact us, because we will definitely um, make sure that you get the information you need. Um, the top two um, placers out of each region, um, out of each category and division, so that's the junior and senior, well, elementary poster, and then junior and senior, um, and um, each category, so all the ca five categories. And then we're talking also about there's a, um, a group division and an individual. So um, the top two placers out of all of those go on to state. And the state contest is held in Austin on April the 20th, and it's at the Bullock Museum. That's where the exhibits are. And then um, the rest of the, the other categories are held on, um, on UT campus. So uh, last year we had about 845 students. And um, so um, it was a really, really great time because um, some of the students haven't been to Austin, they haven't been to the Bullock Museum, and you get to go through the museum too while you're there. So I think that that's it's it's definitely a um, experience for the students to meet kids from all over the all over the state, and then also to um, present their project and share what all they've been working on. Then the top two placers um, again move on from state and go to nationals, except for the elementary poster category, like um, Danny mentioned before, and that the they only go to state. Um, that's fourth and fifth graders. So, but then. Um, for junior and senior, then nationals is uh, June 9th through the 13th uh, at the University of Maryland campus and near Washington, D.C. And last year, was, or this last June was the first year that we were able to go back in person 
to the University of Maryland and for the National History Day contest. And it was fantastic. It was, there was so much excitement. All of the students had such a great time. They meet students from all over the country, well, all over the world, really, because Guam, uh, well, Guam was not there this year, but um, there's China, international um, students from China, from um, South Korea, um, Virgin Islands, American Samoa. So um, they meet students from all over the place. And um, I will say that minus the contest, the competing part, I think the most um, cutthroat part is the button trading that the students get involved in. So they trade buttons from all over the place. And the challenge is, of course, to get all of the buttons from all of the different affiliates that are competing there. So that's pretty exciting for, for the students. And sometimes the whole family gets involved in helping one student get all their buttons. So um, it's a just it's a really great time. And one of the things I really like about the Texas History Day program and the National History Day program is that the judges interview the student um, when they present their project. And so I don't think there's a lot of that interaction between where students kind of are the expert and get to present in a conversational, they don't do a set presentation, they just answer questions based on their project. So I think it's, it's kind of a unique thing that it's more like, um, like a traditional interview. And so I think that it, it provides students with a lot of um, practice and skills in that way too. Um, the entries are judged in various, there's a rubric, and um, the rubrics are in the Google Classroom, so you can take a look at those. So even if you wanted to use this just in your classroom, um, there's a rubric there that you can use for grading. Um, and if, whenever you're thinking about the theme, if you use a writing prompt in your classroom anyway, then the theme could be the writing prompt or the research prompt. So um, then... So the rubric, it's historical quality is 80% and clarity of presentation is 20. So if we're, if we're talking about like the exhibits, um, the historical quality, of course, will weigh more than the flash, than the sparkle, the lights, the blinking, you know, the blinking lights and stuff. Because some students, they'll go, they'll walk into the contest and they'll see these really shiny, you know, um, bright um, exhibits and they start worrying. But then they realize that, wait a second, you know, I did a lot more extensive research and my my project looks really great. So um, the judges, the judges are aware of um, of the historical quality counting for more. So it doesn't have to be really flashy or anything like that. Um, as I mentioned, during the judging process, students are interviewed by the judges and basically they're asked things like, you know, why did you choose this topic? Um, what was your most um, important primary source? Uh, what challenges did you um, encounter when you were when you were doing this project? And so um, we encourage students to practice an interview um, ahead of time, and they can um, they can do that by presenting their doing their project um, for um, the school or for different groups, different clubs, and that sort of thing. So um, and then practice being interviewed. There's um, a lot of different resources that are available. Um, the National History Day website has a, has a ton of information. And we also, in the Google uh, Classroom, there is also, there's, a, there's quite a few different um, resources too. So the theme book is in there. Um, the theme video is in the, um, the Google Classroom as well. The theme video basically explains the theme and breaks it down for you. Um, also, there is a graphic organizer, and there's various resources like that on the NHD page. And then it talks about also how to, what kind of category you want, the student wants to select, and so um, what would fit best with them. And so this, these resources help them kind of break down the theme and break down the context a little bit easier. The, in the Google Classroom, there is a teacher video library and um, that we that I put together for you. And so the teacher video library is, is basically a bunch of it's different video resources. And there's a description. And I also put the links of the video. So if you want to know how long it is before you show it, or if you want to fit it into a lesson, you can do that. 
And there's all sorts of different information on how, you know, what is historical um, significance, what is, um, you know, there's different concepts such as multiple perspectives. Um, National History Day really emphasizes multiple perspectives. So um, there's how to, how to do that, how to do um, an annotated bibliography, all sorts of different resources. So um, I really encourage you to take a look at the video library and um, that can, can give you some ideas too. Okay, Lisa, let, let me back up just a okay. second. One, sure. one thing I wanted to point out on this, uh, on the National History Day website it is you, it's broken down by category and you can see examples of each pro kind of project on the National History Day website. So if you wanna see what a completed documentary looks like, you can go to the documentary page and, and play the, uh, some of the samples that they have on the website there. Um, and same thing with all the other categories as well. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you want to see what finished products look like, uh, you can see them on the National History Day website. Good point. Thank you. Okay, so um, also the TexasHistoryDay.com, that's a website I've been referencing. This has, of course, last year's date on here from the photo. We, <laughs> we still have last year's, but it's, it's all updated um, with this year's. But um, the regions and coordinators over here is what um, you'll want to look at for information on the region. The guides and checklists right here has a theme book, has the um, rule book. You can download those. You can download various things like that. And then if you go to the research resources, um, there are areas for you to um, recommended areas for you to go um, to visit for research, such as we were talking about trusted res um, resources where you can get trusted sources. And so we have some of those um, locations there listed there. Um, and also um, there is a teacher guide to research and a student guide to research that you can use in your classroom. Um, as I said, even if you're not wanting to do the contest, you can use that in your classroom because I'd hope break down the process for you and the student. And so those are really great resources. Um, there's also all sorts of, um, there's uh, We the Pe I think, it, is it We the People? The book, there's a um, different book, theme books that they have um, that talk about like women in history, um, uh, you know, kind of more of a, a politics in history. And then there's one World War One in history. And the articles that are in the books um, have uh, suggested lesson plans, suggested um, sources and that sort of thing. So those are all um, available for you to download as well. One other thing that I want to mention is we do offer special awards that are not category specific, that are um, not like first, second, in addition to first, second, third, and fourth. We offer category award, um, special awards, I mean. And um, those are through from sponsors, and they will donate a certain amount. And um, then they, they set the criteria, the sponsor sets the criteria. So it could be the best um, exhibit on. Um, the, uh, you know, legal history, something re um, regarding legal history. Um, we have some that are the best project on education in history or um, the best project on, you know, African-American history in Texas. So um, if you just take a look at those, then some students will kind of tailor their project around that. So they qualify for some of those special awards too. And um, they could get additional monetary prizes in addition to um, if they win the category. We also have um, a t-shirt design contest. So whenever the theme right now, it's, um, it's on the website, I believe. And so um, but the t-shirt design contest is students can um, submit their design based on the theme for the t-shirt. And then the t-shirt that we have for the year, it has features their design. And that's what the students wear at nationals. And um, students can buy the buy the T-shirt, and um, and then they can get a, a two hundred and fifty dollars, and and a free T-shirt, and um, they'll be invited to the awards ceremony. So um, that's another another avenue that they can they can go and participate. 
So if you would like to implement NHD or Texas History Day at your school, um, there are different ways that, um, different things that we, we recommend. Um, create a, a game plan. There is a, um, a worksheet in the Google Classroom that will do this, that kind of breaks that down for you. And also a sample timeline. And we have provided different resources for you to introduce the theme to the students. Um, between the theme book, the theme video, and different ways that, and the theme narrative. So all that information is in Google Classroom. And then um, for the students, they need just, um, they need to kind of start thinking about topics to research, so brainstorming that. Um, they need to think about um, researching their topics, how they were gonna go about doing that, what avenues they are going to do that through. Um, there's a really good resource in the Google Classroom um, from, it's from Minnesota um, History Day, and they have um, a research worksheet. It's a kind of a booklet that kind of breaks down the process, research process, and they did a really great job on it. And so you can, the students can use that. And some teachers use that, and then they, they use that to grade each step of the research process. Um, then the students will create their projects and prepare for contests. The, um, one, the great thing about the program, too, is that each step of the contest, the students can, can improve upon their project. So they can get the, the feedback that they get from the judges at the regional contest. And if they move on to state, they can improve it based on, on that. And then, again, moving on to nationals, they can improve it based on their, their feedback from the state contest. So, um, so that's why we say that the, the project you see in the beginning at regionals is not the project you'll likely see at state. It will be kind of night and day, and it's great to see that, that transformation. Okay, so we'll go to the fourth poll question. Okay, so based on this, um, will, your student, uh, will your students participate in National History Day program this year? Um, so, and we understand, um, that there's a there's a lot going on with um and your lives are very busy so we will try we can try to help you we will help you however we can um and if you're new to texas history day or national history day one of the great way to ways to see the program is to judge and so if you want to take a look and see what um, region is closest to you that's one of the ways that we recommend teachers take a look at the at the program if they can and um, it it typically um, it typically is a is a motivator. Okay. And we definitely don't want to panic anyone and make them think that this is another program you have to do in your in your classroom. So, um, but if you need any resources or any um, additional help where Danny and I are here for you and we will help you do whatever we can. We will also, we're also willing to do webinars on demand or workshops on demand. And so we can um, do a virtual workshop in your classroom or for your school, if you would like that, if you, and if you need a certain aspect concentrated on, we can do that. So just reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to do that. Um, as we said in October, October 16th is the next webinar, and it's going to do a deep dive into research. And so um, we'll I'll share some, you know, tricks and tips for that. Um, but if you want more information or you have questions or anything like that, um, as I said, you can go to the um, the coordinator regions and coordinators portion on texashistory.com and you can find your region and your coordinator, or you can just email me, um, lisa.berg at tshaonline.org or Danny Corbett at thd at tshaonline.org. Sometimes the thd at tshaonline is easier to remember. So um, feel free to, but feel free to email either, either one of us. We're more than happy to help. If you're gonna be at TXCSS, the Texas Council for Social Studies, um, conference in October in Houston. Danny will be there. So stop by the booth and Danny will, um, he will answer any questions you have. He will give you some, some good giveaway stuff. And um, 
We would be more than happy to speak with you.